بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. So last time we were doing the incident of the Banu Nadir, the expulsion of the Banu Nadir. And uh, we have just one or two incidents related to the Banu Nadir uh, remaining, and then inshallah we move on to uh, the next segment of the seerah. Uh, so, um, are we ready? Should we? Okay. Uh, so, of the things that occurred probably around this time, if not before the Banu Nadir, again for a lot of the incidents of the seerah we don't have exact time frames, but of the issues that occurred around this time, was the command of the Prophet Sallallahu to Zayd ibn Thabit to learn the Hebrew language. To learn the Hebrew language. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu commanded Zayd to learn Hebrew because he said that he wanted someone trustworthy. He did not trust the correspondence. He wanted somebody to know uh, the, the Hebrew language in order to communicate if they write anything or if anything goes on. And so Zayd said, I learned it in 15 days, two weeks. Took him two weeks to learn uh, Hebrew. When the Prophet commands you, you're going to put your heart and mind to it. So he learned an entire language. We're talking about reading and writing, obviously, not just conversational. Uh, he learned it in two weeks. Now, also, by the way, uh, the Prophet made a very wise decision, obviously, in choosing the right person for multiple reasons. Zayd ibn Thabit, firstly, he was very young. And so he had a sharper mind, obviously. It's easier to learn a language as a young man. When the Prophet first came to Medina, Zayd was probably 11 years old. And uh, the tribe of Zayd ibn Thabit introduced him to the Prophet and said, This is our young boy Zayd. And he has memorized so many surahs of the Quran. And he recited some of the surahs. As a young boy, he had already started becoming a hafiz. And as we know, Zayd ibn Thabit was one of the main hufal and the main uh, person associated with the Quran. So much so that Zayd ibn Thabit was the primary compiler of the Quran after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Allah Azza wa Jal chose him. Yani Abu Bakr uh, uh, and Umar, Allah Azza wa Jal chose him through Abu Bakr and Umar to be the main compiler of the Quran. So really we owe a lot to Zayd ibn Thabit. The structure of the Quran as we have it now, uh, Allah Azza wa Jal used Zayd ibn Thabit to basically preserve it. This is the same Zayd ibn uh, Thabit. And also Zayd ibn Thabit as a young child, as a young boy, uh, he actually grew up with uh, his Jewish neighbors and so he already had some background and it is even said that he as a child they go around playing it or not he even attended their uh, halakha school which is their madrasa that he would just go there as well so the Prophet chose somebody who had the perfect combination that he's grown up in that environment he's uh, uh, raised uh, with a lot of uh, the friends that he's speaking their language he's going to their uh, madrasa and uh, he's a young man so he's able to absorb it so basically in 15 days he masters the language and uh, this shows us as we said, uh, the eagerness of the Sahaba and also how quickly Zayd ibn Thabit uh, implemented the command of the Prophet ﷺ. Another issue that happened during this time, not related to the Banu Nadir, but it happened at the time of Banu Nadir. Some reports say when the Muslims were camped outside the fortress of Banu Nadir, Allah revealed the final verse regarding alcohol, i.e. Khamar became prohibited in the incident of Banu Nadir. Now it's not related to Banu Nadir, but it just so happened that that is the time that it came down. When the Sahaba were camped outside the fortress of Banu Nadir, that is when the ayat came down. And we all know the three primary ayat about alcohol. We all know them. Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Surah Al-Baqarah verse 219, Yes, khamri wal maysir. They ask you about gambling and drinking. Tell them that gambling and drinking has a lot of harm and some good. And the harm far outweighs the good. So this is the first verse that came down and there is an indication being given that, you know, try to avoid it, but no explicit command. And this came down, when did Baqarah, when was Baqarah revealed? Badr before and after Badr. So it's the first Madani revelation, really, right? So we can say Badr is very early. Uh, much of, Badr was pre, much of Baqarah was pre-Badr, by the way, because Baqarah is the longest surah. So perhaps this came down maybe even the first year or the early second year of the Hijrah. Right? So from the very beginning of Medina, alcohol is kind of sort of being too, you know, limited. Then, right after the Battle of Uhud, an incident occurred where uh, a drunk uh, Sahabi led the prayer and he made some very ridiculous mistakes. Obviously, he's drunk. So Allah revealed Surah An-Nisa. Surah An-Nisa is post-Uhud. And in Surah An-Nisa, verse 43, Allah says, يَا أَيُّوَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَقْرَبُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَأَنْتُمْ سُكَارًا Don't come close to the salah when you are drunk. 
So now, as we know, the timing, therefore, of drinking is limited to post-Isha and pre-Fajr. So this is the first prohibition, actual. Don't come to the prayer when you're drunk. Which means don't drink throughout the day. Only late night you can drink. And then, in the battle of Banu Nadir, when the, Prophet, when the Prophet and the Muslims are camped outside, Allah revealed the verse that became eventually Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 91. That khamr and uh, divination by arrows. Uh, uh, and ansab is idols and aslam is the divination so gambling and alcohol and idolatry and divination what is divination 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 is what abdul muttalib did when he wanted to see which of my sons should be uh, spared or give the blood money you're pulling arrows in front of a idol this is aslam so Allah said, all four of these things are filthy, leave them. فَاجْتَنِبُوهُ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ So this ayah was revealed at Banu Nadir. Also, one final story related to Banu Nadir, which is a very uh, interest, peculiar interest, and it's something that most people do not know because the books of Sirah gloss over it. It's found in some books of Hadith. And really the, the researcher needs to compile together bits from the Sirah, bits from the Ahadith, bits from the Tafsir to form a more comprehensive narrative. We find a Hadith in Abu Dawood, Sunan Abi Dawood, uh, that uh, Ibn Abbas said that there was a custom from the ladies of the Ansar pre-Islam, Yathrib, pre-Islam, that if she had many miscarriages, she would make a promise to Allah that, Oh Allah, if you bless me with a son, I'll make him a Jew. Why? Because the people of Yathrib, they felt the Yahud were superior to them. And frankly, they were. Because they were the Yathrib, Yathribites were idol worshippers. Right? And the Yahud were Ahl Kitab. And the Yathribites did not have culture and civilization compared to the Yahud. And the Yathribites could not read and write, and the Yahud are a people of learning. So in every single marker, the, the tribes of the Yahud are at a higher level than the tribes of Yathrib. Right? And there was a complex that was both ways. The one side felt superior and they acted superior. The other side felt inferior and they knew they were inferior. So the people of Yathrib, the women of Yathrib, as a superstitious custom, they would say, Oh Allah, if... I, if you give me a child, I will give him to the Yahud and he'll grow up a Yahudi, but he'll still be obviously biologically my son. So there were a group of such people who had been given over to the Banu Nadir, and the main tribe that they did this for was Banu Nadir, uh, probably because of the, the strong ties that they had between the Banu Nadir and the uh, Khazraj. And these young men, they're all men, because that was the point of give me a son. Uh, these young men had grown up and been adopted by the Jewish tribes and they were for all practical purposes considered Jews. Now, when the expulsion happened, the parents are now converted to Islam and their young men who are now adults, we're not talking about two, three-year-olds anymore, right? Now these men are now Jews, they're married amongst them, they're now, and now the expulsion orders come, that they have to be expelled. So some of the Ansar whose children were there or whose sons were there said, Wallahi, we will not allow our sons to go away. They will come back to us. They're not going to go away. We want them to be with us. And they wanted them to renounce Judaism and convert to Islam. Why? Because anybody who converts to Islam, obviously, the punishment is, or the, the expulsion, and as we said, uh, I think two weeks ago we mentioned this, or last week, I forgot now, that a number of people of Banu Nadir converted. A number of them converted, so they were, they're allowed to take their property and their, uh, everything was, was remaining for them. Anybody who converts, then the expulsion obviously is not going to take place for them. So a number of them converted, the bulk of them went into expulsion. So these parents wanted to force their adult children to renounce Judaism and accept Islam. Interesting scenario here, right? But these children are now fully Jewish. They feel Jewish. They've been raised Jewish. And they believe in this uh, religion. So what happened? Allah revealed in the Quran the famous verse that we all know. And now we know sabab al nuzul of this verse. لا إكراه في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغي. It's a beautiful, profound message here, right? And the verse clearly shows 
It came down in favor of the Jews, basically. You see the point here? The Muslims are told you cannot force your adult children to convert. لا إكراه في الدين. You can't force them to become back into Muslim. قَدْ تَبَيْنَ رُشْتُ مِنَ غَيْ Truth and غَيْ are, are, are clear. It's up to them now. If they want to insist on being expelled and leaving Medina, you can't force them to accept Islam. That's their prerogative to remain Jews and they can practice as they see fit, but they will have to obviously be with their people. And this is exactly uh, what Allah Azza wa revealed and this demonstrates for us without any you know, apologetics, without watering the religion now, Wallahi, this is the truth. You cannot force somebody to be a Muslim. La ikrah fi din, even if it's your son, even if it's your daughter, that's their decision when they are adults. Obviously, when they're children, then every society says the child is raised according to the morals of the parents. Once the child becomes an adult, once it is independent, he or she is independent, what can you do? La ikrah fi din, qad tabayyana rushdu min al ghay. And this uh, shows us that the religion of Islam does have freedom of religion, but I want to say, be very clear here, not the way we understand it in the West as well. Let's be very frank here, because as you know very well by now, I am no apologist. I don't whitewash, I don't try to... No, there is major differences between our faith and Western humanism, secular and democracy. And There are differences. Yes, we can find a compatible, happy means to live, but ideal Islam is not ideal capitalism. Ideal Islam is not ideal Western civilization. There are many differences. And Islam allowed a type of religious freedom that was unparalleled in the world during its time. However, truth be told, modern society allows a type of freedom that was not allowed back then because it's equal for all. Right? And Islamic civilization did not allow that type of freedom. The type of freedom that modern, secular, Western democracy gives. It's a modern phenomenon. This didn't exist 200 years ago, 500 years ago. It's a modern phenomenon. It's a different tangent to talk about. But, as I said, comparing it to the other civilizations of its time, Islam was unparalleled in allowing civilizations, in allowing sub-civilizations to flourish. Whereas, compared to Europe, compared to most other lands, you had to follow the dominant interpretation. Forget different religions, look at Catholics and Protestants. How many civil wars? The Hundred Year War, the Thirty Year War, the issues in France. You know, every single time a Protestant group is forming, the Catholics are basically persecuting them and vice versa, the Inquisition. They can't even bear other fates. And by the way, as a tangent here, this is why Western civilization had to come up with secularism to survive. The civil wars of Christianity gave birth to modern secular values, right? Whereas we never had that problem, we never did. And our society civilization was very different. And we didn't need the type of secularism that exists now. They needed it in order to live or else they were at each other's throats, right? And that's why throughout the 17th, 16th, 17th century, thinkers are now coming forth, Thomas Paine and others, and they're basically arguing for a type of uh, uh, neutrality for all faiths because they can't live with the notion that one faith is better than others. Whereas Muslims, historically, we see this from the very beginning. Muslims believed our faith is true, but hey, if you want to follow your faith, that's your business. It's your business in this world and the next. We're not going to say it's okay l morally, but we'll say it's okay legally. And this is the difference that Islam Muslims do, right? It's okay legally, that's your business. But morally, we say this is incorrect. And this ayah is explicit proof. La ikraha fi deen. It came down for Muslims that they're not allowed to force their own sons back into Islam. Right? And that's a very profound uh, interpretation of freedom that never existed before that point in time. Um, also of the things that are occurring at this point in time, and again I'm trying to link personal issues, fiqh issues that are happening, uh, and other issues with the seerah, so that we're going bit by bit, so that it's not also just a bunch of battles, because most books of seerah, they just have battles, and then they ignore or they overlook issues that are of a personal nature, the process of marriages, they put them in the last chapter altogether. I'm trying to put it chronologically. Of the things that occurred around this time, and there's some debate exactly when, but the birth of the first grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the first grandson of the Prophet ﷺ, and that is of course Al-Hassan, Al-Hassan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now most authorities say that Al-Hassan was born in Sha'ban of the fifth year of the Hijrah. This is majority opinion. But some say, no, it is Hussein who was born Sha'ban, fifth year Hijrah, 
which means from those interpretations, they would say Hassan was born Ramadan, fourth year of the Hijrah. These are the two opinions when Hassan was born. Between Hassan and Hussein was 11 months. They were literally, literally just a part less than even 10 months, some say. So you can see from Ramadan to Sha'ban, right? So it was something that uh, basically as soon as uh, Fatima radiallahu anha finished her uh, postpartum bleeding, she basically became pregnant again with Hussein. Hassan and Hussein were less than a year apart. Okay, so according to one opinion, Hassan, and this is the majority opinion, Hassan was born Sha'ban 5AH. Some say, no, it's a mistake. Actually, actually Hussein was Sha'ban 5AH, which would make Hassan then Ramadan 4AH. Clear? Right? But inshallah, the stronger position is that he was born Sha'ban 5 AH. And when he was born, uh, the Prophet was very happy at the news, obviously, and he said to Ali, Show me my son, bring me my son. And he called him my son, Show me my son. And he brought him Al Hassan ibn Ali, and uh, he said, What did you name him? And Ali said, I have named him Harb. Harb means war. It's a very common pre Islamic name, right? I have named him Harb. And the Prophet said, no, rather he is not war, he is beauty, Hassan. Right? Hassan is, you know, good beauty, right? And we know, uh, and this is reported by Imam Bukhari in his Adab al-Mufrad, we know that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would change bad names to good names. This is his sunnah. Any time a, a bad name came, he never liked these names. And he would change it to a positive name. Once an old lady came to him and he asked her, what is your name? So she gave a name that basically means, you know, ugly or something like this, you know. And so uh, he said, no, you are not, uh, you know, uh, this name. You are Hassana. Basically, you are the beautiful one. Even though she's an elderly old lady, but why have a name that is derogatory? And so he flipped her name around and he made it the exact opposite, right? Also, any name that was vainful or glorious, something that will bring about pride, he would change it to something that is neutral. So this shows us Islamic names are positive but not arrogant, positive but not conceited, right? So uh, we mentioned that he married Umm Salama. Remember Umm Salama had children, remember? Right? One of those was a daughter called... Barra. And Barra is like the righteous one. Barra is like, you know, Barra is, you know, Al Bir. The Barra is like the one who is very pious, the female. The female who is very pious, right? And this is a self testimony. Like you're saying, I am the Mu'mina, you know. And it is not good to have names that have this connotation of self-piety, which is different than having names that are positive. You see that there's a clear line here, right? Praising yourself. Boastful names are not good. So he changed her name to Zainab. He said, no, you are not Barra, you are Zainab. Zainab has a positive meaning. Zainab means, there are many interpretations. One of them is the, the beautiful flower. This is one of the flowers of the desert, the smelling, uh, uh, the fragrant flower. This is one of the meanings of Zainab. And there's other meanings that are mentioned as well. So he said, no, you're not Barra, you are Zainab. So he would change bad names and he would also change names that are self-promoting, egotistical. These are the two types of names he would change, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, Harb was a very common pre-Islamic name. And so Ali wanted it to be like the warrior name. He said, no, you're not Harb, you're Hassan. Right? So Khalas, his name was Hassan. And by the way, so when the next child was born, he didn't have to ask. He just changed Hassan to Hussein Khalas, you know, no questions this time, you know. Hussein means the little Hassan. Tasghir. Right? Hassan Hussein. He's like, Khalas, I know what you want, so we'll give him Hussein. So uh Fu'ail, yani Jabal Jubail, you put the, the it's a little, you know, Hassan and little little Hassan is uh Hussein. And uh in Abu Dawood we learned that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh gave Adhan in Hassan's right ear. He gave adhan in Hassan's right ear. And most of the ahadith about aqiqah involve Hassan. Most of the rulings that we hear about aqiqah, what to do when the child is born, it's because the Prophet ﷺ is instructing Fatima and Ali about Hassan. That's how we know most of the rulings of aqiqah. And so he told Fatima that shave off her hair and give the weight of his hair uh, silver in, uh, in silver in charity, right? And obviously this is an expression. Uh, it's not meant to be actually done because you cannot weigh the hair of a baby. It's something, but basically give some trivial amount in charity. And so uh, the rulings of, uh, and then Fatima said, uh, should we perform an aqiqah for him? 
And the Prophet said, no, I will do it. He's so happy. He's the grandfather now, right? So he performed the aqiqah on behalf of Hassan. And he was the one who sacrificed the, uh, the two uh, sheep and he uh, made the invitation. So this shows how proud and how happy he was of uh, Hassan. And Hassan and Hussein, of course, bo the both of them, they have very uh, high status in Islam. And our Prophet Sallallahu loved them immensely. There are so many ahadith about Hassan and Hussein. Our Prophet Sallallahu uh, Hassan of course was the one that when he went into sajda, Hassan's a toddler, two years old, a year and a half, and he's crawling onto the back. And the Prophet Sallallahu is not getting up to allow the kid to play on his back. And once he's giving the khutbah, and Hassan and Hussein, they come in from uh, the Fatima's house, and they're wearing long red Thobes. And so they trip over the thobe, they trip over each other, so the both of them fall somewhere in the masjid. So the Prophet ﷺ stops the khutbah, and he comes rushing down to pick up his two grandchildren. And then he carries them onto the mimbar. So one hand, each child, right? He's carrying Hassan and Hussein on the mimbar. And he said that verily what Allah says is true. Al-malu wal-banuna zinatul hayat. No, sorry. Innama amwalukum wa fitna. Right? That verily what Allah says is true, that these two sons of mine, He called them sons, He would always call Hassan and Hussein my sons, meaning He's so proud of them and they are His grandsons. These two sons of mine were tripping and I could not be patient enough to let them get to me and I stopped the khutbah and came and picked them up. Right? So He's making an excuse that, look, just forgive me, just I can't, I can't let them stumble, I need to go and pick them up. Right? So He says, إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَلَادُكُمْ فِتْنَةً And uh, of course, the famous hadith of Bukhari about Al Hassan, especially, is very well known. That in another occasion, the Prophet ﷺ intentionally held Hassan giving the khutbah. So, this is not he's tripping, he actually wants to make a point. And he's holding Hassan throughout the khutbah. And he then says during the khutbah, and this is in Sahih Bukhari, so it is as authentic as possible, right? He says during the khutbah, Inna bini hadha sayyid. وَلَعَلَّ اللَّهَ أَنْ يُصْلِحَ بَيْنَ فِئَتَيْنِ يُصْلِحَ بِهِ بَيْنَ فِئَتَيْنِ عَظِيمَتَيْنِ مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Right? That this son of mine, إِنَّ بْنِي هَذَا Once again he calls him my son. إِنَّ بْنِي هَذَا سَيِّد And Sayyid here means one of respect, an undisputed leader. This is what Sayyid actually means, right? In our culture Sayyid means something else, the descendant of the Prophet Sayyid actually means the leader. إِنَّ بْنِي هَذَا سَيِّد it means the one who will be obeyed. It means the one in authority. So he said, this son of mine is a Sayyid. And a day will come when he shall cause reconciliation between two large groups of Muslims. Two large groups of Muslims are fighting and Hassan will bring them back into unity. Right? And that is exactly what happened as we know. That Ali and Muawiyah radiallahu anhuma ajma'een. And by the way, notice very explicitly the Prophet called both groups believers. And this is Sunni methodology. Both groups, he said, are believers. And this is Sunni aqidah. The group that says one was right, one was wrong, they have disobeyed. Sorry, not right and wrong. One was mu'min and one was not mu'min. As for right and wrong, then yes, we can say which one was more correct, yes. The group that says that one was mu'min and one was fasiq, or astaghfirullah, one was kafir. The mu'tazila say fasiq, and then these other groups, they some of them even say uh, kafir. Anybody who says this, this goes against exactly what our Prophet ﷺ said. Fi'ataini azimataini min al-Muslimin. Two large groups of the Muslims, and he called both of them Muslim. Yes, one of them made a mistake. Yes, this is Sunni methodology. And Ali was closer to the truth then, Muawiyah, we believe this firmly. But we believe that Muawiyah radiallahu anhu was sincere even if he made a mistake. And Allah will forgive him because he was sincere. And he didn't want this bloodshed to happen as Sunni historians explain. Nonetheless, so when Ali was assassinated by the Kharijites, right, by the proto Kharijites, when as Ali was assassinated by the Kharijites, the people of Medina immediately gave Hassan bay'ah. And, and this is something many of us don't know and we should know this, Hassan became the fifth Khalifa. And Muawiyah was also given bay'ah. And this was the first time that there were two opposing Khalifas in Islamic history. So for six months there was a type of stalemate. Until the both of them there was talk of war. And Muawiyah said, 
when he heard that there's going to be now a major war. Muawiyah said that if we fight them and they fight us, and we kill them and they kill us, who will be left of the Muslims? Go send a messenger to him and see if he's willing for any sulh. Now Muawiyah was not willing to give up his position. He wants the burden on him. That's why his position was, right? Radiallahu anhu, that's his position. So he's putting the burden on Hassan through this message. Because he's saying, are you going to give me any sulh? He's not saying, I'm willing to go down. The, the message is very implicit and it's understood. That look, let's not go to war again. Can you just figure out a way that I can remain and let's not go to war, right? And so al Hassan gave a very emotional lecture in Medina, this is recorded in the books of history, and he basically, because you know, there's anger here on both sides, people have been killed for the last you know, three years, there's major war going on, his people are willing to die again, right? And so he gave a very emotional, powerful lecture, and he then gave them the course of option, do you really want to go on and then, you know, to the death and khalas, let Allah decide, or for the sake of the ummah, let's just forget about it and just leave it to them with some condition. So his followers agreed that, okay, give up the khilafah and uh, will agree to the conditions. And so he gave, you know, a long list of conditions that, uh, you know, uh, these are the books of history that mention it. No, this, we're going jumping the gun here. The point being, he gave up his own power, his own rights, and after six months, he basically abdicated and uh, resigned. And this was in... Uh, this was in Rabi' al-Awwal of the 41, the 41 AH. Rabi' al-Awwal of 41 AH and Muawiyah radiallahu anhu then became the undisputed Khalifa and therefore, a lot of Muslims don't know this, we believe the correct position is there were five Khulafa al-Rashidun and Hassan is the fifth of them. Even though he ruled only for six months but and this will shock the other group that opposes us. But wallahi, for us, truth is more beloved than, than just opposing them. We will speak the truth, whether it is for us or against us. We love the family of the Prophet ﷺ the way they deserve to be loved, without going to exaggerations. And we consider the Khilafah of Hassan to be the rightly guided Khilafah, and the Khilafah of Muawiyah to be the Khilafah of a dynasty, and that is the best dynasty. But it's not as good as the Khilafah of Hassan. And so, our Prophet ﷺ said, by the way, a very interesting hadith, Sahih um, Muslim Imam Ahmad. Our Prophet ﷺ, another tangent, but subhanAllah, these topics, uh, people should know them. Our Prophet ﷺ said, تَكُونُ الْخِلَافَةُ فِيكُمْ ثَلَاثُونَ سَنَةً عَلَى مِنْهَاجِ النُّبُوَّةِ That khilafa will be amongst you for 30 years upon the methodology of the Prophet ﷺ. Then there shall be a righteous kingdom for as long as Allah wills. Then that will be taken away. Then there shall be an unrighteous kingdom, a jabbar or a tyrannical kingdom or a rulership for as long as Allah wills. And then it will come back to khilafa ala minhaj al nubuwa. And then he was quiet. This hadith is Muslim Imam Ahmad. So this shows us, as the Prophet said, for 30 years there will be khilafa ala minhaj nubuwa subhanallah down to the very month down to the very month exactly 30 sana he passed away rabi' al awwal and when did hassan abdicate rabi' al awwal down to the very month 30 sana right and then there was a mulkan that was considered to be a just kingdom and then there is a unjust kingdom when does this Demarcation happen, Allah knows best. Some have said this is the Abbas and the Umawi, and then the others. Modern interpretations have said this is when there was a real Khilafah up until the collapse of the Khilafah, then colonialism brought the other rule. Right? Allah knows best. Yani, but it does make sense. And then there will come a Khilafah ala minhaj al nubuwa and then he was quiet, which means khalas, the end of times. Then he was quiet and khalas, that is the end of times. Nonetheless, back to where we are over here. And that is Hassan and Hussein. Uh, so many hadith about Hassan and Hussein. Uh, the Prophet said, Al Hassan wal Husseinu Sayyida Shababi Ahlil Jannah wa Abuhuma Khairum Minhuma. Hassan and Hussein 
are the leaders of the young men of Jannah and their father is better than them. Hassan and Hussein, Sayyida Shababi Ahlil Jannah. Hassan and Hussein are the leaders of the uh, young men of Jannah and their father is better than them. And we can go on and on. Wallahi, Hassan and Hussein, they deserve entire lectures. And inshallah, maybe, maybe after we finish the seerah, then we'll start another uh, series of lectures. Allah knows best. In any case, moving on. Uh, so the next major incident that occurred is the expedition of, it is called Al Muraisir. And it is also called Ban al Mustaliq. Both names are given. And Muraisir is the location, Ban al Mustaliq is the tribe. So both names are, you know, either the people or the location. And the Ban al Mustaliq uh, lived obviously at a place called Muraisir, or to be more precise, it was a pond called Muraisir. And so they lived next to this pond, next to this water pool, and that water pool is called Muraisir. And they lived between Mecca and Medina, south of Medina, south of Medina. And the Muraisir, they had an alliance with Abdul Muttalib in the days of Jahiliyyah. They had an alliance with Abdul Muttalib. So when the Quraysh attacked Mecca, uh, Medina, they recalled that alliance. So the Muraisir sided with the Quraysh even though, ironically, the Prophet is the grandson of the one who made the alliance with, which is Abdul Muttalib. But they sided with the Quraysh against the Muslims, and they helped them in the battle of Uhud against the Muslims. Additionally, their location was very strategically satisfactory or positive for the Quraysh, because this is like a bastion they can go to in between Mecca and Medina. This is a safety zone, and it's not too far from Medina, a day or two's journey from Medina, right? So it's very dangerous for the Muslims. And then the real straw that broke the camel's back, the real issue was that news came through scouts and through spies that the leader of the Ban al Mustaliq, and his name was Al Harith ibn Abi Dirar, after the defeat of Uhud, he wanted to launch a surprise attack against the Prophet ﷺ and therefore help the Quraysh because he's suffering as well. You know, the caravans, right? His income has been cut off, right? The money that he's getting, he's not getting it anymore. So he wanted to surprise attack the uh, Muslims and the Prophet ﷺ hears of this. So first thing he does, he confirms the rumor. How does he confirm the rumor? He sends one of the Sahaba by the name of Buraida ibn al-Hasib and uh, as an anonymous person, meaning he didn't recognize, uh, al Hari did not recognize who Buraida was, and he pretended to be a Bedouin. And he said to al Hadith, the chieftain of the Banu Mustalaq, I have heard that you are launching an attack against Medina, and I would like to join in order to get some of the booty. So this is a ruse, it's basically a trick, that I'm gonna join you guys, and I just want to share. And Al Hadith is looking for strong men. And uh, Buraida was, and the Prophet chose obviously wisely. So this is like a warrior now. So he's happy. He's like, okay, yes, we'll join and we will give you a share. So now the confirmation has come. Right? And look here, the Prophet did not attack based on rumors. He confirmed and verified. Made sure that Al Hadith actually wants to attack Medina. Right? So when Buraida finds out, he you know, agrees and then in the night he sneaks away, he goes back and he tells the Prophet it is true. It is true. And al Hadith doesn't pay attention that where is this man, was he from the side, he doesn't think. And so the attack was a complete surprise. He had no clue that the Prophet had found out. So when the Prophet found out, he immediately rallied together over 700 of the Sahaba and they launched a complete surprise attack. 30 of them were fully armed. They had horses, they had weapons, and it was a clear, easy victory. Like everybody knew it would be an easy victory. And by the way, because of this, many of the Munafiqun participated in Muraisir that they had not participated in Badr or in Uhud or any other expedition. Why? Because this was a dead, uh, a sitting duck. This was a sitting duck, right? This was something. There is no possibility that there's going to be any major battle. Complete surprise attack. One small tribe, the Muslims have the advantage in that they're, they're going to be you know, swooping in. So now, at this battle, the Munafiqun, mashallah, tabarakallah, volunteer now. 
right? So they came in large quantities, including Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. And he's absent from Badr, he's absent from Uhud. Now they are with the battlefield. And this is why a number of incidents happened in Muraysiyah. That's what we're going to talk about, uh, Muraysiyah. And by the way, when did this battle occur? There's a huge controversy. Uh, some say fourth year of the Hijrah. Uh, Ibn Sa'd al-Zuhri, Ibn al-Qayyib, Ibn Kathir, Ibn Hajar. Uh, they say Sha'ban of the fifth year of the Hijrah, which is the same year uh, uh, Hassan is born, the same month. Ibn Ishaq says Sha'ban of the sixth year of the Hijrah. And Ibn Ishaq was followed by Ibn Jarir al-Tabari and Ibn al-Athir. So you have fourth year, fifth year, sixth year. Three opinions, right? And Muraysi' is important not because of the battle, but because of what happened after, which is the slander of Aisha. That the slander of Aisha occurred on the return from Muraysi'. So when did it happen? Fourth, fifth, or sixth, huge controversy. And we have classical scholars on both sides, and this is one of the major problems of the seerah, to reconstruct events and dates. And Ibn Ishaq, who is the authority, he says sixth year of the hijrah, but this is problematic. And it's problematic for multiple reasons. Most importantly, uh, because, as we'll come to uh, next time we give the class, in the incident of the slander of Aisha, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala an has a very important statement that he says in it. Now, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh died, he was one of the leaders of the Ansar. And he died after the battle of Khandaq. After the battle of Khandaq, uh, tech, uh, and to be more precise, right after Khandaq there was Banu Quraida, one month after Khandaq, right? And Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh was the person they chose to be judge. And he died right after that. Right? Now, if Muraysi' took place Sha'ban of the sixth year, this throws a big spanner into all of this narr narrative. Why? Because Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad is already dead in the sixth year. Why? Because when did Khandaq take place? The fifth year of the Hijrah, Shawwal, Dhul Qa'dah is when Bani Quraida took place. Right? So, this brings a big problem because Ibn Ishaq says sixth year Sha'ban. But then we find other scholars, and Ibn Sa'ad is another early scholar. In fact, he is one of the teachers of Ibn Ishaq, or no, sorry, not teacher, that's not right. Uh, is the Ibn Hisham's teacher. Uh, Ibn, Ish, Ibn Ish Sa'ad in his tabaqat, and Ibn Sa'ad died uh, 220 Hijrah. So he's also an early authority. Ibn Sa'ad says fifth year Sha'ban, not sixth year Sha'ban. So we find an opinion that says fifth year, and this makes more sense. As for the opinion that says fourth year, perhaps we can explain this because some of the very early scholars counted the first year as being the year be right before the Hijrah. So they counted that like zero type basically, right? So they started the calendar a year earlier. So for them, Badr takes place first, Uhud second, like that, right? So from, for that minority, which only the first 300 years we saw three, four scholars, then that opinion basically disappeared. For them, everything is one year behind because their system of calendaring is, is, has a different measurement system. So based on this, insha'Allah ta'ala, the strongest position is going against Ibn Ishaq. And that is why 90% of the seerah books will have Muraysi' after Hudaybiyah and after Khandaq. Take a look at it, right? Whereas I am doing it before Khandaq, before, before Hudaybiyah, right? I'm doing it now. Why? Because Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh could not have been a part of Muraysi' if it took place in the sixth year of the Hijrah. It must have taken place in the Sha'ban of the fifth year of the Hijrah. This makes sense, okay? As for the fourth year, it's impossible. Also because Sha'ban of the fourth year, what happened in Sha'ban of the fourth year? People were taking notes. What happened in Sha'ban of the fourth year? <laughs> Part two of Uhud, when they went to Badr again, right? Uhud, Uhud number two. That was Sha'ban fourth Hijrah, and nothing happened. So Sha'ban fourth Hijrah, they're in another place. They couldn't be in Muraysiyah. Therefore, without a doubt, inshallah, the strongest position, Muraysiyah and the incident of Aisha and all of this, it took place fifth year of the Hijrah. Make a note because as I said, most of the Seerah books, they follow Ibn Ishaq pretty much to the core max and therefore their ordering will be Ibn Ishaq's ordering. Whereas it appears that uh, this is a genuine mistake and 
uh, Muraysi' took place fifth year of the Hijrah. Now, as we said, Muraysi' was not that important in terms of what happened during the battle. It's what happened after the battle that's important. And the Banu al-Mustalaq, oh by the way, the, I forgot to mention, the Banu al-Mustalaq, they had one of the most prestigious idols of Arabia. They had Manat. وَمَنَاتَ الثَّالِثَةَ الْأُخْرَى They had Manat, right? Alat, al Uzza, Manat, these are the three main idols mentioned in the Quran. They had Manat. So Banu al-Mustaliq, this is the, they, and this is a very uh, main highway. And they are taking advantage of Manat and their geographic location. Now they're hurting because nobody's on the highway. So they want to attack the, the Muslims to get their highway back, right? They want to have the, the caravan back. So uh, the Prophet ﷺ attacked them, as we said, fifth year of the Hijrah. And most likely, uh, we have a report that says it was a Monday the 2nd. So the 2nd of Sha'ban, the fifth year of the Hijrah. He left Medina with 700 men and over 30 horses. Many of the, the men were armed. And he surprised attacked them right after Fajr. And they were so unprepared that the shepherds were leaving the town, the women were going f uh, to collect the water, the children were coming, going outside to play. They were completely unprepared. And when they saw the Muslims coming, they ran screaming back and they had to surrender. There was hardly any fighting because there was simply no preparation. And very few people were killed, perhaps a handful, less than only a few men stood up to fight and less than 10 people were killed. And the bulk of the tribe, over 2,000 camels, over uh, 5,000 sheep, around 1,000 people were taken prisoner of war. Uh, and uh, uh, most of them obviously were women and children. Uh, and these were not prisoners of war, they were basically uh, captives. As for the Muslims, there was not a single casualty amongst them, except for one accidental misfiring from, what is it called, a friendly fire, right? The friendly fire is called, right? That's what happened back then, right? None of the uh, Banu al-Mustaliq could kill them. But one of the uh, Ansar, one of the Ansar, he mistakenly thought a person was attacking, whereas in fact he was one of the, uh, the Muslims and his name was Hisham ibn Subaba, and he accidentally uh, killed him. And there's a footnote to this story as well, that Hisham had a brother in Mecca uh, who was not a Muslim, and his name was uh, Miqyas ibn Subaba. Miqyas ibn Subaba. When he heard that his brother had been killed, so he pretended to convert. And he went to Medina, pretending to be a Muslim, and he demanded the blood money, 100 camels. You killed my brother, I want the money. So, the Prophet gave him 100 camels, because this is shari'i. It's an accidental manslaughter, it's our fault, we'll give you. So, he got 100 camels. The same night, he killed the Ansari at night, in the middle of the night. He killed the Ansari who had killed his brother, murdered him in cold blood, and then took the camels and fled back to Mecca. This man, Miqyas, was one of the four men whom the Prophet ﷺ said, catch them dead or alive, no mercy. Fatih Mecca. This is one of them. You see, every one of them has a story. And this is one of them. Right? This is that man that this is the height of treachery and treason. Right? And you're stealing money and you pretend to be a Muslim and then you murder the Ansari and then you come back. So, and he was killed. He was, and then there were six people, two, two women and four men. Right? So four men as we said. And ironically, or not ironic, but Allah's Sunnah, uh, Allah's Qadr I should say, half of them were actually forgiven in the end. Two men and one woman were actually forgiven. Only two men and one woman was actually executed. And this is one of those men who was executed, right? At the Fatih Mecca. In any case, getting back to the story. Uh, so, uh, the entire tribe of the Banu Mustalaq has been captured. And some of the men fled. Uh, very few fought and they were killed. As we said, less than 10 deaths reported. And therefore, this is a massive victory with very minimal amount of fighting. And the story of Banu Mustalaq is not significant for the battle. It's for three things that happened after it. Three things that happen after it, right? And the largest and biggest of them is the slander of Aisha, which we will delay till the next class. Because that's going to take probably an entire lesson or a lesson and a half. So what are the other two? The first of them, which is the simplest to understand, is the addition of one more of the mothers of the believers. And that is Juwaidiyah. 
بنت الحارث the chieftain الحارث the chieftain جويديا بنت الحارث and the story uh, of Juwaidia uh, is, is mentioned uh, by none other than Aisha radiallahu anha herself in Ibn Ishaq in the first person and she mentions that Juwaidia uh, was captured along with all of the others and as is the case with the uh, prisoners of war and with the captives they are distributed to the army and Juwaidia was given to uh, Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shammas, one of the Ansar, Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shammas. And she agreed with Thabit to purchase her own freedom. And this is something that is uniquely Islamic, that Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَكَاتِبُوهُمْ إِنْ عَلِمْتُمْ فِيهِمْ خَيْرًا This is in the Quran, that if your slaves want to purchase their freedom, then make a deal with them and negotiate their freedom with them if you see them to be good people. And according to one position in Islamic law, now we don't want to get into the fiqh of riqq, it's a big whole topic, but according to one position in Islamic law, the slave has the right to demand his freedom. And you have to give him a fair price. And you give him time to work, and he'll give you that price over the period of his working, he'll give you that, and then he will get his freedom. Right? So, Juwaidia is the daughter of a chieftain, she doesn't want to be a slave. So immediately she negotiates that this is the amount, and so I'm not going to be a slave, I'm going to get my freedom. So uh, Aisha says, so that she arranged to free herself. And then she is speaking in the first person, and she is saying, and she was a halwatun malaha, which means she was very sweet and very beautiful. And no one saw her except that he was captivated by her beauty. And she was probably around 17, 18 years old at the time. And she came knocking on the door of the Prophet in this Aisha's house, right? Asking for help monetarily to get her freedom. So now that she's arranged with Thabit a price, now she's going directly to the Prophet and she said, can you help me out with some bit and going to other people and whatnot, negotiating where to get the money from, loans, whatnot. After all, her father is the chieftain, somehow he'll manage to get, her father by the way was not taken prisoner. Her father had fled. So her father is not a prisoner with the other people. Her father and the other noblemen have fled and she is now uh, a captive. And Aisha says, as soon as I saw her, I hated her. <laughs> Because I knew that the Prophet would see in her what I am seeing. It's human nature. I knew that the Prophet would see in her what I am seeing. And as soon as she entered and she said that, Ya Rasulullah, I am Juwaidiyah, the daughter of Al-Hadith, Sayyidu Qawmi, I am basically the, the princess or the chieftain of my, my tribe, and you have seen what has happened to me, I have arranged to free myself from Thabit, so help me in this matter, meaning, give me a loan, we'll pay you back, we'll negotiate something, right, but help me out. So the Prophet ﷺ said, what if I give you something better? She said, what? He said, I will free you myself, not alone, forget that, I will free you myself and marry you. He's proposing to her, right? Right then and there he proposes to her. And uh, she agreed to this and he made her mahar, her freeing her. The mahar was the freeing. That he basically paid the money and uh, this is not a loan then obviously and that became her mahar. Now, what happened? The news spread amongst the Ansar that the Prophet ﷺ married Juwaidiyah. Then they said, how can we have the in-laws of the Prophet ﷺ as our slaves? So one by one they began freeing every single captive until all of them were freed down to the last person. Then Al-Hadith came back to Medina and he came back negotiating a ransom for his family and tribe. He didn't know all of what's going on. And uh, he asked for his daughter back. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Juwaidiyah that it is her decision. If she wants to, she can go back. I'm not stopping her. And Juwaidiyah chose and, she, and he gave her the right to go back. Now this is a technical point. And from this the fuqaha derive that the husband has the right to give the wife, 
the right of divorce for a time period. That if the situation is very tense, but the husband does not want to divorce, right? The, he can tell the wife, look, you know, think about it. And if you really want it, then the decision is yours. And he can say, I give you an hour or a day or give a time period. The decision is yours. So he's handed over the right of talaq to his wife. And this is in essence what the Prophet is giving to Juwaidiyah. That the decision is hers. If she wants to, she can go back. That I'm not stopping her. And the Prophet was like that. He never, astaghfirullah, he did with Zayd, his own adopted son. Look at what he did. You know, remember the story, right? You know, Zayd ibn Harith, remember the story, right? I'm not, and he was a slave. Technically, he hadn't been freed yet, right? I'm not stopping, he wants to go back, he can go back, right? So, Juwaidiyah said, of course, I want to stay with you, Ya Rasulullah. And so, uh, Juwaidiyah remained with the Prophet ﷺ. When Al-Harith saw his own daughter willingly choose the Prophet ﷺ over him, this affected him so much, he embraced Islam. Like he couldn't believe his own daughter is choosing to remain with the Prophet and this affected him, like there must be a reason here. And so Al-Hadith embraced Islam. When Al-Hadith embraced Islam, the whole tribe embraced Islam. Because he's the chieftain and that's the way they were back then. The whole tribe embraced Islam. So the Prophet made him the leader again, because after all, you know, he was their leader. Gave him back all of the wealth and the sheep and the goats and the camels, right? So they all returned back to status quo as it was, except they're Muslims now. Can you believe the beauty of this story? Wallahi, it's just one of those amazing stories, right? Everything is exactly the same, except that Juwaidiyah is now wife of the Prophet ﷺ. Hadith is the chieftain, their animals are their animals, their camels are their camels, their property is their property, now they're Muslim. And this shows us the real meaning of what is qital and jihad fi sabilillah. It's not for ghanima, it's not for wealth, it's not for power. They saw the beauty of Islam. Nobody was, nobody forced anybody, right? Nobody forced anybody. But they see the reality of this faith, they embrace it, and they go back exactly as they were with the added beauty of Islam. And Aisha comments that I don't know of any lady who brought more blessings to her tribe than Juwaidiyah. Like one lady's decision to marry the Prophet ﷺ, it was an entire catalyst. Look at what happened after that, right? And this shows us the wisdom really of, really the entire concept as we said of jihad, of even the multiple wives of the Prophet ﷺ. Juwaidiyah by the way was known for her piety, for her righteousness. She was one of those who fasted and who did a lot of charity. And there's a hadith in uh, uh, Sahih Bukhari about her that once the Prophet ﷺ visited her on Friday. And uh, she was fasting on Friday. And he asked her that, uh, did you fast the day before or the day after or, or are you intending to fast the day after and she said no I'm just fasting today on Friday so he told her in that case do not choose only Friday as a day of fasting we know in our Sharia we don't specialize Friday for fasting he said if you want to fast fast a day before or after join it with something right so this is Juwaidiyah she's just fasting on Friday also once the Prophet ﷺ prayed Fajr from her house so he spent the night at her house he went to pray Fajr and he stayed a long while and she was in the, her musalla area doing dhikr. He returned in the middle of the day when he finished his talking with the men and there she is sitting in the same place still doing adhkar. So he asked her, have you remained in the same place since Fajr? She said yes. So he said, should I not tell you of a dhikr that if you do it, it will give you all of this reward that you have done? So she said, what? So he taught her, Subhanallah, adada khalqihi Right, this is Juwaidiyah. This is the Juwaidiyah. He taught her this beautiful uh, dhikr that all of us should memorize. The dhikr of four, five, six hours will be done if you say it properly with iman and ikhlas. This simple phrase, Subhanallah, adada khalqihi. The number of his creation. وَزِنَةَ عَرْشِهِ And the weight of his uh, throne. وَرِضَى نَفْسِهِ And the pleasure of himself. وَمِدَادَ كَلِمَاتِهِ And the ink of his pen. Subhanallah to all of this. To the extent of all of this. And this is uh, uh, what he taught uh, Juwaidiyah. Juwaidiyah lived uh, a relatively long life. She died around uh, 50 Hijrah. 
uh, which is the same year, by the way, that Hassan died. I forgot to mention Hassan died 50 years as well, 50 Hijrah as well. Juwaidiyah died in the 50th year of the Hijrah at the age of around uh, 65 years old. And uh, the, the, the marriage of Juwaidiyah really shows us some of the primary wisdoms of the multiple marriages of the Prophet, and in particular with Juwaidiyah, it is very clear that there is a huge potential and wisdom to be gained. Now, what if somebody says, what do you say about her beauty and her youth, and was this not something uh, that the Prophet was, uh, was interested in? Here we have some of those people who say that the Prophet uh, did not have any such desires, that he was above these desires. But frankly, you have to... Aisha knows her husband better than we do. And she's saying the fact. And I will be very honest here. For me, the perfection of our Prophet ﷺ is to make him a normal man who can control his desires. Not to make him into an angel. For me, this is the ultimate role model. right? Some of us, we have this connotation or notion that the Prophet ﷺ is somehow superhuman. But this is not what the Qur'an says. Right? إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ He gets hungry, he gets tired. In the battle of Uhud, he's going to bleed. The blood is going to come out, right? And yes, he is a man. And he sees Juwadiyah. And he sees in Juwadiyah exactly what Aisha thought he would see in Juwadiyah. There's nothing haram. You see, the notion of somehow being attracted and wanting to marry as if somehow it's something haram. No. The haram is to do it outside of marriage, correct? What is haram being attracted and proposing? And that's exactly what our Prophet ﷺ did. He proposed. He said, what if I... And it's an offer. It's up to Juwadiyah. She could have said no, right? And when he gave her the choice later on, she said, no, now that I'm your wife, I want to remain your wife, right? So personally, and this is the interpretation of many scholars as well, by the way, I don't see any problem. I don't know why some of us as a culture, we feel like as if our process should not be a man. What's wrong with this? Aisha is saying that I knew that uh, you know, he would see in her what, uh, what I saw. She knows. And Juwadia, why not have this and that? Why not marry her and she is who she is and also free all of her people and cause them to accept Islam, right? What's the, what's the haraj in that? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed for our Prophet what he has not allowed for others and this is something that is well known in the uh, Quran and therefore uh, there is nothing wrong with saying exactly as Aisha said and also adding to this that our Prophet was also thinking long term that what's going to happen if I marry the daughter of Al-Harith, and that is all of the relatives of Al-Harith and all of the people of the tribe, they will be given a special status of honor without having to pay a penny to anybody. Because if the people had demanded money from Baytul Mal, the Baytul Mal would go bankrupt. right? But by marrying Juwaidiyah, the message is given that just free these people. And there's no doubt that the Prophet ﷺ saw something in the Banil Mustaraq and in Al-Harith that showed him these people have some good in them. And inshallah they'll embrace Islam. And that's exactly what happened. That eventually all of them ended up embracing Islam. And as you said, one of the most bizarre and beautiful small stories of the seerah. Right? Where did it begin? And where did it end? And subhanallah, this is the uh, beauty of this religion and explains to us as well one final point. It also explains to us that the Islamic concept of riq and ubudiyah, which we translate as slavery, wallahi, we shouldn't even call it slavery. Because... The notions of Islam are so different than what existed here in this country 200 years ago, which they called slavery, that it is an insult to Islamic riq to call that what was happening over here 200 years ago. Is that clear or should I? Like we shouldn't even use the term. Because when you use the term automatically you think of 17th, 18th century America. And there is no doubt that in the history of humanity, one of the worst manifestations of slavery was what took place right here. Far worse than ancient Greece, far worse than China, far worse than Arabia. Islam came and brought forth a system that was unparalleled. Now the beauty of that system was that Islam does not need it. Islam made it secondary. If it exists, these are the rules. If you cut it off, Islam is perfect without it. You see the point, right? And it's an amazing way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, basically, obviously, the perfection of the sharia, that all of the laws of ubudiyah, of riq, are not necessary for Islam. You can cut off the entire chapter of riq and still have a perfect Islamic state. You see, the, you see and this is, this is the reality now. 
that not, as far as I know, no scholar in the world is calling for a return to that. Khalas, that was something in the past. We don't have to apologize for it. We don't have to sugarcoat it. We should be proud of the fact that when the world practiced a very barbaric system, our Sharia humanized it. And our Sharia gave laws, so much so that if the uh, Abd demanded freedom, like Juwaidiyah, you have to give it to them. You negotiate what is a reasonable price and then say, Khalas, that's your, wh which system allowed this, right? Additionally, so many other rules, not the time to get into, but the main point, who are the Abid in Islam? <coughs> Only one source. These are captives or prisoners of war that are not ransomed. There's only one source. And that is, you have a captive or you have a prisoner of war who's not ransomed off. That is the only source of riq or abd. Otherwise, th what happened uh, in Africa, what happened in other places where free people are captured and purchased here, our Prophet ﷺ said that anybody who does this has the curse of Allah on him. Anybody who does it, Allah will not look at him. This is the worst of mankind. Is a person who caught a free man and sold him as a slave. This is a hadith. These are of the worst of the merchants or the worst of the, the Allah's la'na, Allah's curse. Allah's not going to look at them. So what happened as the slave trade, and sadly sometimes Muslims were also involved by the way in the 17th century. Let's be honest here as well. We're not going to sugarcoat that. That many times it was uh, Muslims, not all the time. Sometimes Muslims are the ones who sold the slaves to others. This is clearly haram. There's no question about it. In our Sharia, there's only one source of Abid, and that is prisoners of war and captives who are not ransomed. What are you going to do with them? Are you going to kill them? Because they're gonna, if you don't, they're going to come back and kill you. I mean, they're going to go back to the enemy, right? What are you going to do? You want to put them in prisons? For how long? Who's going to feed them? The society absorbed them. And by absorbing them, each one is taken care of is fed, is given shelter, and eventually the key point, they all embrace Islam and are eventually freed. This is a reality. Historically speaking, many of these slaves eventually became their own dynasties. The most famous example is the Mamluks, right? The Mamluks were called Mamluks because they were slaves. Mamluk means a slave. And eventually the Mamluks became the very last of the dynasties before colonialism, right? I'm going into my tangents here, but the very last of the Mamluks fought the forces of Napoleon Bonaparte. It's surreal to imagine this, but this is what happened. When Napoleon landed in Masr in 1792, when Napoleon invaded Egypt, that was the last of the Mamalik. And Napoleon is fighting them with guns and horses, and the Mamluks still have their skimtars and swords, and obviously they're going to lose, but still, Mamluks, who are the Mamluks? They were... <coughs> the slave dynasties. So the final point, inshallah, and that is the whole concept of riq and ubudiyah. We need to be very frank about this. The Islamic system developed it to make it humane, to make it something that was feasible for the time, and it also made it something that is not needed as a part of the Sharia. It encouraged good treatment of slaves, it encouraged the freedom of slaves. So many kafaras deal with freeing a slave. If you lie, if you cheat, if you break a promise, if you break your fact, free a slave, free a slave, free a slave, free a slave, right? So many of the things freeing a slave. So Islam came and took that system that existed in the world, modified it, gave it a, a humanity that never existed, and most importantly, made it something that you don't need to have. Therefore, now in our times when the world has pretty much abolished uh, legal slavery, then alhamdulillah, we don't need to go back. So, I don't know of any scholar who's calling for those times again or whatnot. This is now a done time and alhamdulillah, we don't need to worry about this. And with that, inshallah ta'ala, we have come to the end of uh, this session. Uh, announcement. Next Wednesday, there will not be a sira. We will resume after two Wednesdays. I have to go on an international trip to the Norwegian lands or to Sweden. So I will not be here for next Wednesday. The Tuesday class will be here. So Tuesday, Surah Yasin will be here at 7.30. The next sira will be two weeks from today, insha'Allah ta'ala. Any other announcements or questions? Yes, quick question, yes. What about the Aisha's reaction in Prophet Obviously, she was jealous. Obviously, but Aisha radiallahu anha being the Muslim, the Mu'mina that she was, she accepted whatever the Prophet did, but it is human nature. This is again, 
It is human nature that she will feel jealous, she will feel irritated, but her iman will eventually conquer and let it go, right? And this is the perfection of Aisha's nature. Other questions? Yes. She's a slave, she doesn't need a wali. At this point, she's a slave. But she wants to purchase the freedom. So the rules of fiqh are different. For the slave, they are different. For the mukatab, and she was a mukataba, they are different. So she doesn't need, as a slave, she does not need uh, the permission of her biological wali. She only needs the permission of the master. And because the master is Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shammas, who is a Sahabi, so that's not a problem. Okay, yes. <coughs> No, they left with them. They left with them. Yes. So you're bringing up the whole controversy of the issue of Muraisir and when it took place. Exactly. This is the one of the main positions that is trying to show that Muraisir took place in the sixth year of the Hijrah. Right? And that is Hamana bin Tijash and her sister Zainab bin Tijash. And no doubt this is a problem. So whichever position you hold, you have a piece of the puzzle that cannot be put in. Because Sa'd ibn Mu'adh is mentioned in Bukhari. And that's going to be a problem, right? So you bring up the issue which is a controversy for the last 1200 years. And we're not going to solve it now. Uh, and that is when did, when did Muraisiyah take place? Fifth or sixth? But at the same time, what's the big deal? I mean, look, let's flip this. I, I know it's very interesting, but okay, suppose it was fifth, suppose it was sixth. There's not much, yani, ish thamarat al khilaf. Yani, what's the, what's the thing that's the, 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 the natija of it, right? So, I mean, yes, it's a controversy that exists. And by the way, I have to say, mashallah, this is a, a very advanced sira class. If you compare this to anything else, you will know. Still, I put the disclaimer, this is not a high level. Because to go to that level, we really are going to go into every single ikhtilaf and the riwayat and the asandid and whatnot. And um, with modesty, inshallah, a'udhu billah for any arrogance, I don't think anything in English is ad as advanced as what I'm teaching you. Because I know what I'm going back to and I know the level. Yet, I have to water it down. Because it's not appropriate to go to that level unless you are doing an advanced PhD or master's in sirah or something like this, right? So these issues that you're bringing up, I intentionally do not bring them up, if you try to get my point, right? These issues that you're bringing up, I don't think it is wise that... Uh, yeah, so, no, Zainab bin Tijash took place in the fifth year, most likely. In which case, it is a problem. As I said, the issue that you bring up is the biggest evidence that is used by those who say it took place in the sixth year of the Hijrah. Right? Hamana bin Tijash and Zainab bin Tijash. Whereas Sa'ad bin Mu'ad is the biggest evidence used by those who say it took place in the fifth year of the Hijrah. This is the problem. And, wallahi... I don't have an answer to this. And this is just one of many chronological issues that we have actually overlooked and not gone into. If you want to, we could go into 10 other issues where there's an ikhtilaf over the year that it occurred. But what's, I mean, what's the big deal if it's fifth or sixth or fourth? I mean, in the end of the day, the incident has been preserved. And we derive more from the incident. And Allah knows best, inshallah. In any case, it is. <laughs> we have two questions. Yalla, go ahead. Bismillah. Bismillah, go ahead. There's no question. This is a time of war. What's the problem here? Yani the Banu Mustaliq at the time, the Quraysh, this is open war. 
Every country in the world spies on its enemies. There is no problem here. So we allow them to war? That's what I'm saying. We allow those to war. Look, there's a difference between uh, treachery and between deceit. Treachery is never allowed. Khiyana is never allowed in Islam, even in war. But deceit means like this. Any subterfuge, tactics, right? You know, uh, Sun Tzu in the Art of War, which is the earliest book ever written about war, over 2,000 something years old, right? What is his first rule? Um, Deceit is nine tenths of war, something like this, you know, like lying is nine tenths of the, winning the battle. This is Sun Tzu, the, the Chinese philosopher, the first book of war ever written, and the number one rule in it: you're not you're, you're not going to be winning a war if you're 100% honest, you know. You have to pretend there are weapons of mass destruction if you want to go to war, okay? <laughs> Otherwise, it's not going to happen. So this is the way the world works, and. I have said a million times, our Sharia is a practical, pragmatic Sharia. It's not a hypothetical, theoretical Sharia, always turn the other cheek and do whatever you want. It's a realistic, living in this world Sharia, right? And if you want to live in this world as a political entity and power, well then, during times of war with your enemy, yes, this is what is done. Even though, in the perfection of our Prophet he never did it. Look at this. He never did it. The max he did was Taudiyah. Where are you from? I am from water. Right? Abu Bakr, who is this? He is my guide guiding me on the way. Right? So no doubt the better is this. But in this case, yes, inshallah. Yes, in the back. And then we're done. We're late. Yes. The child from a slave in Islam, in Islamic law, occupies the exact same status as a child from a full marriage. And the best example for this is Ismail and Ishaq. Ismail and Ishaq. Ismail's mother was Hajar. Ishaq's mother was Sarah. And amongst our own history, the majority of the Abbasid Khulafa were sons of slave women. The majority of our Khulafa of early Islam were sons of slave women. Islamic fiqh says that any child uh, born to a, uh, a Jariyah, and I don't even like using the term slave honestly, but we have to because any child born to a Jariyah, that child will take the name of the father, inherit from the father, has the full biological rights of the father, and then the mother gets an automatic upgrade. As soon as the slave, the Jariyah, gives birth to a child, she becomes Umm al-Walad. And she can never be sold, and she becomes free instantaneously after the man dies. Automatic upgrade when you have a child. Right? So all of this Islamic law guarantees and many other rulings as well. But yes, so the, to answer your question, then yes, the child that is born to uh, a jariyah will be a full uh, child. And in fact, uh, our Prophet ﷺ had Ibrahim from Maria. And Maria was a jariyah. Maria was not of the Ummahat al Mu'mineen. Maria was of the jawari, of the Prophet ﷺ. And he did not marry Maria. Okay.